Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dave Deptula, Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies. Today, we're excited to present our latest research project, The Quantum Advantage, Why It Matters, an Essential Next Step by our own senior resident fellow, Heather Penny. Now, we tackled this research topic for two reasons. First, there are significant near-term warfighter benefits that we can realize from quantum technology if we make the right investments now and adapt a strategic approach. Second, we assess that while many defense officials toss the term quantum around, too few know actually what the technology encompasses. Sure, the technologists understand it, but we also need to educate those in control of policy and budget decisions. To that end, for the Department of Defense to make good choices on quantum technology, senior leaders need to understand its many potential uses, not merely just quantum computing applications. Now, Heather Penny created a three-part series aimed at these objectives, and in doing so, she charts a vector for securing the quantum advantage. Part one demystifies the science behind quantum technologies. Part two explains why securing a lead in quantum matters to warfighters. And part three recommends next steps U.S. defense leaders should take to achieve a quantum advantage. Now with us today to discuss this topic are two key leaders involved in this field of research. So I'd like to offer a heartfelt welcome to Dr. Mike Heideck, Deputy Director of the Air Force Research Lab Information Directorate, and Laura Thomas, Chief of Staff at Inflection, a key player in the quantum innovation field. So with that, Heather, let me turn it over to you to give us a rundown on your reports. Thank you, sir, and uh, welcome everyone to uh, this rollout of the Quantum Advantage, Why It Matters, and Essential Next Steps. As General Deptula mentioned, you know, we embarked on this project because while quantum is a word that is often bantered around, it's not well understood. But we probably should, as it's often grouped with the advanced technologies associated with the third offset. So quantum sounds smart, but do we really understand what it is and what it can do for the warfighter? Uh, is, again, this project has spanned three papers, the first of which is a primer on the science behind quantum. It describes, in a basic and accessible manner, quantum principles and behavior, what a qubit is and why it's special, and how scientists are now able to control matter at the quantum level. The second paper focuses on quantum computing. And contrary to what most people believe, quantum computers are not just super fast supercomputers. They're specialized machines with unique capabilities and limitations. And finally, we focus on the quantum industrial base. This technology is so hard to do, it's so nascent, that while it's exciting, the industry itself is actually very fragile, and it will require the Department of Defense to deliberately cultivate this industry if it wants to mature the companies and their suppliers such that they can develop and deliver quantum capabilities at scale. So quantum information and the science technologies, they matter because they have the potential to fill core capability gaps that warfighters can expect to face in a peer conflict. We've come to depend on second offset series of technologies to provide this asymmetric advantage to warfighters. PNT, data links, precision weapons, advanced sensing, advanced processing. And when I say PNT, we need to break that down into position, navigation, and timing. Because while we group those together into GPS, they are actually separate, uh, separate capabilities. And we know that China is deliberately targeting these capabilities. They want to negate, deny, and destroy them. Jam GPS, jam Link 16, uh, jam our radar's ability through EW. And quantum technologies could offer an alternate means to secure these foundations. But to secure this quantum advantage, we have to make smart policies and smart programmatic choices. Like take this OV1 chart. Uh, this overview, you know, defense leaders need to be able to assess all of those sensors, all of those lines, uh, to be able to understand which are science fact and which are science fiction. 
They, that's why they need to understand the science behind quantum. Leaders need to be able to evaluate for themselves the utility and battle space practicality of a proposed quantum capability. So it's not just simply understanding, it's about what do they need to do to field these advances. Because admiring the problem or understanding the problem capability isn't sufficient. We need to ensure that warfighters have those capabilities in their hands. So you have to understand the science in order to be able to field it. So what is quantum? What's important to understand about quantum today is that technologists now have the ability to directly and precisely isolate, control, manipulate, and measure matter at the quantum level. This is very different from existing technologies like lasers and MRR machines where they had special attributes because we were able to leverage quantum behavior. Now we can actually control quantum behavior. And this ability to do that, to directly control quantum matter, is what we need to understand if we're to move past platitudes. And that's why we wrote the first paper as a primer, to demystify the science of quantum mechanics. Because even for leaders with technical backgrounds, the confounding nature of quantum science makes it difficult to understand the premise, use case, or even readiness of quantum-based capabilities. Quantum is so different from our everyday experiences. It's not intuitive. Principles like superposition, entanglement, wave particle duality, or even coherence, they do not conform with our expectations of the world. So we cannot just hit the I believe button. Quantum is hard to do, but it is a must do for our warfighters because the capabilities that it could unlock could offer a leap ahead into a new regime of competition could, that could sidestep adversary countermeasures and re-secure for our warfighters who put themselves in harm's way the foundations of how we go to war. It could re-deliver position, navigation, and timing, uh, precision, advanced sensing, and more. There are different ways, moreover, of doing quantum, of doing the work of controlling and accessing those uh, subatomic particles and their behaviors. And so we, again, we encourage you to reference the first paper of the series to more fully understand it. What you need to know, though, is that each of these modalities, how we do quantum, uh, have their own unique advantages, limitations, requirements, and use cases. So one modality is not the only or best solution for everything. DOD leaders, uh, leaders need to, should seek to develop each of these modalities by understanding them, matching them to their best and most oppor uh, opportune use case. So for example, cryostats, which do quantum by cooling superconducting chips to temperatures that are colder than outer space, they have some very unique strengths in quantum computing. Whereas neutral atom and trapped ions are very good at computing, but they also have unique applications in timing and advanced sensing. And photonics excel at quantum communication and networking, moving quantum information from one place to a different physical location without destroying that information. We need all of these modalities applied to the right use cases to provide the warfighters the capabilities they need. And we know that China is actively fielding quantum capabilities. Depending on what assessment you read, China has spent between $4 billion and $15 billion over the last 13 years to develop applied quantum technologies, to develop their components and hardware, and cultivate their own Chinese quantum industrial base and supply chain, and testing these programs in the real physical world. This is important. When evaluating uh, what nation wields a quantum advantage, most researchers and consultants, they use patent counts, academic papers published, and academic papers referenced to determine who is ahead. But using these metrics, the United States is generally ahead in quantum computing and sensing, and China has an edge in quantum uh, communication. But I would argue the real proof is who is fielding real world capability and who has the industrial base to deliver. Quantum engineers I've spoken with from different research teams and companies strongly say that this kind of demonstration can have a, a cross-pollination effect across the other fields within quantum. So solving uh, you know, one technology in one area, like communication, can, have, can accelerate 
other areas like computing and sensing. And China's demonstrated this long-term commitment to developing fielding capabilities. They've had a vision for quantum communication across satellites. They're working through the engineering, building their architecture, building their industrial base, and the control and inter interface systems. So they're doing the hard work of transitioning quantum out of the laboratory and into the real world. So we have to make decisions about what technologies to pursue, and we have to understand quantum to do that. We need to be able to focus on high potential. The practical science makes sense. The technology is ready. We need to focus on high payoff. What will actually make a difference to the warfighter? Because theory, laboratory, and effective fielded capabilities that integrate with existing warfighting systems can be three totally different things. And if you don't know the science, it's hard to make that assessment. Take quantum radar, for example. This picture is from a Chinese TV during an air show promoting a Chinese quantum radar, which promises to see stealth aircraft, right? It's supposed to overcome the challenge that the radar energy from the transmitter is deflected away from the sending radar, right? That's part of how stealth works. Quantum radar, however, entangles photons, stores one while sending the other out, and when that free space photon hits a target, its state is altered, thereby changing the withheld stored pair, pair, electron, or photon. But here's the problem. Accurately storing quantum particles can be challenging. One cannot monitor the status of a stored photon for change without collapsing it. And it would be very difficult to develop an accurate or useful tracking solution. So while quantum radar sounds incredible, it actually would not be very practical or effective. And that's an example of why we need to understand the science. Senior leaders and warfighters should be equipped to evaluate proposed capabilities and ensure the concepts can effectively meet warfighter needs in operational scenarios. And that also means moving past research and development. This is the risk. China is demonstrating their quantum capabilities in the real world. And that is where the US needs to move if we are to secure a meaningful advantage. An acquisition program of record is urgently needed if US policymakers are serious. Because even an initial minimum viable capability can kickstart and accelerate the broader uh, quantum ecosystem. And it's not just about the valley of death of moving from R&D uh, to, uh, to fielding capabilities. Engineers need real requirements to design to. Those real world conditions, surviving the rugged and rough realities of the battle space, the challenge of integrating that quantum capability onto a platform, the form, the fit, the function, the swap C, and integrating it with other onboard systems, controls, and the human interface. And only an acquisition program of record can move the quantum industrial base past hand-built one-off experiments and into real-world high-volume production. Now, the US government understands the importance of, of quantum. And that's why in 2018, the US Congress passed the National Quantum Initiative Act. And in 2023, passed the Chips and Science Act. But these are not focused on DOD's unique needs or capability gaps. They are focused primarily on research and educational initiatives to build a workforce for the future. And it's important to remember, though, that research, remain research remains research until there's a robust market demand. DOD cannot treat the quantum industrial base like it's normal. As an emerging technology, small startups, usually spun out of universities, dominate the landscape, the quantum landscape, as innovative and dynamic companies that DOD should focus on and support. DOD should grow their quantum base through real acquisition programs of record, investing in the supply chain of cross-country components, components and hardware, and exploring public-private partnerships to build production facilities. The DOD needs to realize that not all of these entities within that quantum ecosystem are the same. They don't have the same dynamics, the same resources, or the same objectives. For example, the defense prime companies all have quantum research ongoing in their strategic technology sections. And the advantages the primes bring is that they understand integration, warfighter needs, and the acquisition system. But there's no programmatic pull or profit pull to incentivize them to scale their quantum investments. 
large IT companies, however, have clear commercial objectives and market re rewards in maturing quantum computing. And so they've invested billions of dollars in resourcing this. So DOD should leverage that as much as possible. And that USG and labs, they're conducting research and development, and some are partnering with other universities and companies. And I'm excited to talk about um, AFRL's MagNav Challenge, for example. But many of these efforts are long lead, and they won't impact the industry for 15 or more years. So these small quantum startups is really where the DOD needs to focus. They're dynamic and innovative, and they represent the bleeding edge of quantum technologies. But as small startups, they have unique needs that are very different than the small businesses that DOD has tailored its small business programs to. Quantum industrial base is nascent. It's fragile. It's expensive to do. So for example, like the semiconductor industry, quantum is not cheap. Facilitizing for production can cost billions of dollars. IonQ, for example, will spend over a billion to build a production facility in, Wa in Washington state. So these costs far outstrip what's available in small business vehicles like DIU or AFWorks. And R&D dollars are too small to scale these companies. As one executive said, R&D is starvation wages. We can't survive on that, and we won't be able to keep our venture capital rounds going forever. A Wall Street Journal article just this past weekend noted that the Pentagon has balked at VC startups. And a chief executive stated that if companies don't win contracts at a size and volume greater than what they're getting, they're in trouble. We risk venture looking at the defense market as a failed experiment. So when considering what uh, quantum applications prioritize, DOD leaders should focus on high potential, high payoff capabilities. And that's really in the middle of the chart. If we lose access to GPS, which is that atomic clock in the far upper right hand corner, we will really need to have quantum capabilities so they're there in the middle. That are the prototype stages, they're ready to begin to move forward into engineering and they can have a high to existential impact for the warfighter. AUKUS could provide an opportunity for DOD to begin to accelerate quantum technologies and share the effort with our trusted partners. It could expand the supply chain and widen the market for quantum companies, and it could also break down internal company barriers that currently must be firewalled due to security and ITAR restrictions. While we think of AUKUS as mostly recognized for nuclear submarines, Pillar 2 of AUKUS expands that collaboration to the advanced technologies that you see on the screen. And so, to, but to fully leverage the potential, DOD and the U.S. government must address other policy and regulatory obstacles like Buy America, ITAR, and FMS. The Torpedo Act, which is proposed legislation and has not yet been passed, truncating onerous regulations for partners and enhancing deterrence operations. <laughs> I love how they paired torpedo with AUKUS. Um, they, you know, this act could potentially uh, facilitate this by designating AUKUS signatories and expanding it to, China, uh, to Canada as domestic for these purposes. But again, we have, it has to be passed by Congress. So I'd like to end this briefing on a positive note. Um, AMC and AFRL's MagNav experiments, in my mind, stand as an exceptional model for how to move quantum technology forward. And other MAGCOMs should look at what AMC did and how they partnered with AFRL and follow their lead. AMC and AFRL got quantum into an operational setting through their MagNav experiment. And so this is, a, this is an example of why quantum cannot stay lab in a box. Because the value of the magnetometer, and that's the quantum sensor that they were using to navigate across the Pacific, um, it determines the, its position in navigation by correlating the magnetic fields it senses to a known map of the Earth's magnetic field. But here's the challenge. The C-17 that they put that magnetometer on also generates its own magnetic signatures that change and fluctuate based off of the aircraft itself, the engine speeds, um, the RPMs, the avionics, and so forth. So part of the engineering challenge that AFRL had to overcome was to null out these spurious magnetic inputs uh, from the C-17 real time so that the magnetometer only sensed or only reported where it was on the Earth's magnetic field. And then they'd integrate that onto the C-17's navigation system. So it can be done. It's very hard. But this is the proof in the pudding of the way forward. 
So what do we recommend? First, we need to understand the quantum science so we understand its high potential, high payoff use cases. And DOD then needs to match those to the uh, quantum capability and pursue these kinds of operational experiments. They need to establish programs of record to create that pull, provide engineers something to design to, and provide the market a potential profit to help keep their funding moving forward. DOD should look at how they can provide funding and programmatic vehicle to facilitate public-private partnership, and then finally enact policies to enable the sharing of quantum technology across our most trusted allies. Thank you. Well, thanks, Heather. Really appreciate you laying that out for, uh, uh, for all of us and our uh, audience. What I'd like to do now um, to continue is to give our guests the opportunity uh, to share your thoughts uh, on this topic. So, Mike, why don't we start with you and then sure. we'll go to Laura. Okay. Well, great, General Deptola. Thank you very much for the invite. And Heather, thank you for that great overview. It was just uh, very inspiring, uh, especially as we saw ended with the success story and the Magnav <laughs> experiment. Total so, fangirl. Yeah, <laughs> I can see that. So uh, quickly, I'd just like to spend a few minutes describing AFRL's quantum research program uh, and the technologies that we're developing. We've been performing R&D for many years uh, in this field. Uh, and beginning in 2018, we developed a AFRL-wide enterprise-wide quantum strategy covering several technology areas that we're working on at AFRL. And as you described, probably no surprise there, timing, sensing, networking, and computing are all areas we're working. Six of our nine technology directorates in AFRL are working uh, quantum technology. So it's, it's a big area for us, and we have many people uh, working across several geographic sites uh, on these areas. So things like clocks, advanced clocks, how we can improve stability, how we can uh, improve uh, C swap performance uh, and move that, you know, continue to push those out in the field. And very closely related sensors, AFRL has work in cold atom sensors, gradiometers, gravimeters, other types of sensors uh, as you just discussed, such as magnetometers. Uh, really key areas for us, as well as electric field sensors. I think uh, Rydberg sensors, sometimes those don't get enough talk and press yeah. as maybe they need to, to be getting. Uh, timelines, though, are very critical here. When we think about putting these together in quantum-assisted PNT type systems, clocks are pretty much here, you know, one to three years out, maybe or so, and sensors around two to five years as well. So when you talk uh, military readiness and, and you know, being able to push technologies out, you know, timing and sensing, I think, are very critical. Uh, two other areas we're working on, networking and computing. So, of course, with networking, how we can link th things not only as quantum computers together, but quantum sensors, the sensors, the clocks. And really for us, especially where I work in the information directorate, a key there would be information security, right? How we can really secure our information using quantum techniques. Quantum uh, Networks a little further out, you know, I'd say certainly five to ten years out on the horizon. And then finally, the last area to hit upon our major tech area, quantum computing. But the thing to stress here is that AFRL is not developing quantum computers. We're leveraging hardware that it's out there from our commercial partners. You listed a few of those. Uh, we're very connected with that. I'll probably mention a few words on that later on. But we're really looking at the algorithms of interest there. They could solve practical Air Force problems. Not quite there yet. You know, there's a lot of uh, thought into what areas are key uh, and, and could have an impact, so things like optimization, quantum-assisted machine learning, and finally quantum simulation when you think about materials development and being at the very foundational quantum level. And then finally, how you put all this together, you know, as we look to push tech out into the field, it's really a cyclical development. So as we learn things, we have to go back into the lab and perform more R&D to continue to get things right and to learn it. And then last, uh, always want to give a shout out to the folks in AFRL working workforce development. So that's very critical for us because as we look at these very hard areas, you know, where do the folks come from? So we really need to put a lot of emphasis on that, and that's certainly a key piece of the national quantum strategy as well. Well, thanks for that, Mike. Um, really appreciate it. And uh, Laura, over to you. Sure. Well, thank you so much for having me today, uh, General Deptula of the Mitchell Institute. Heather, it's great to be on the panel with you as well as you, Mike. Uh, great to see you again. Um, I'm here because China thinks the future belongs to them, and uh, I don't think that's true, but we have to fight for it, and we have to make the right decisions now to make sure that we can secure you know, the future that we want for ourselves, for our kids, 
et cetera. And, you know, I know everyone dialing in uh, to the call generally understands and believes that, but there's a lot of tactics that have to happen, things that we have to do to really move the needle to get quantum out of the lab and into the field. And yeah, you know, I've been in the anticipation business um, for, for quite some time, first as a CIA officer, and then jumping into uh, deep tech as the chief of staff at Inflection. Um, just a, a short story, you can't really have a, a CIA, former CIA officer on a panel without a war story. I imagine it's very similar for Air Force <laughs> officers as well. Um, but. Uh, it was probably about seven years ago, I was out sending uh, an encrypted message to a very sensitive asset for CIA. This message had White House attention. I, I, needless to say, I did not want to mess up and send you know, an inaccurate message or you know, mess up the encryption in some way. So I took a, a, a technical officer with me because I don't have a, a technical background. And just to, you know, two eyes on it to make sure that everything was was correct. And I started asking him, you know, what is it about this encryption scheme that we really think our adversaries can't tap into it? And he gave me a, a quite long and technical answer, um, but it essentially boiled down to, well, it would take the Chinese, you know, thousands of years to crack this message. And I said, well, what would challenge that assumption? And he said, well, quantum computer. So what is that? I've never heard of that. And he walked me through what a quantum computer was. And I said, well, when, when are they going to be here? I mean, this, this is a big deal. We need to be planning for this. And he said, well, it could be five years, could be 15 years, could be never. We just don't really know. I said, well, I hope someone's doing something about that. And uh, I started really going down the rabbit hole of quantum at that point. And ultimately, about three years ago, decided to jump from the government to industry in a quantum company. And what I learned quite quickly is, yes, the quantum computing threat is absolutely very real. We need to be doing things today to prepare for it. But quantum is actually here and now uh, with quantum sensors and uh, timing devices. And you know, Heather, certainly, you walked us through the overview of that. And for the last three years, I've just been immersed in that, working with physicists and engineers every day, some of the brightest people solving some of the hardest problems. And what I've learned is that it's here. But we have to have the nudge from government to really get it out of the lab and into the field. And you know, we, we have these very small batch capabilities. We like to say at inflection, you know, we have an entire trophy case of prototypes that we've built, especially from R and D money. But now it's how do we get it into you know uh, field of devices at scale where the warfighter can use it and, and truly benefit from it, and we can advance. Uh, more quickly than China. And you know, the capabilities are real. We really just need a customer. Okay, well, very good, Laura. Appreciate uh, both your remarks and, uh, and Mike. So let's, uh, let's jump into this in a little bit more uh, detail uh, before we open it up to, uh, uh, to our audience for, uh, uh, for uh, some questions. So this first one's for um, all of you. Um, everyone touched on this. Uh, but I think it's crucial, uh, and that's that quantum technology is so much more than just fast uh, computing power. So what I'd like to do is ask each one of you um, if you could uh, uh, share your experiences on the top misconceptions uh, surrounding uh, quantum. Well, I'll kick off. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. I think one of the top misconceptions is just that quantum is only computing. Because quantum computers have such potential, uh, and people understand them really as just super fast supercomputers, and they look at where they started in the 1990s, and they go, wow, now I have a terabyte of storage on my phone. This is very similar to quantum computing. So they don't understand what quantum computers are, what their potential is, but they also think that's where it stops. And so with the potential of quantum computers, that's the marketplace, that's the draw. And this ties into what Laura had finished saying, is that there's so much more to quantum technologies that could be even more impactful for warfighters. I think the Department of Defense and the US government neglects those sensing capabilities, the timing and the communication um, at our risk. Because we need to understand that those technologies, in some cases, have DOD specific uses. And if the DOD doesn't generate the requirements in the program of record to pull the development of that technology and the fielding of that technology forward, we're going to be sitting without any potential, uh, any capabilities. Laura, your thoughts? 
Yeah, I, I would just add to that poll. I mean, there are commercial markets out there for quantum, and there are certainly going to be commercial customers, but we, we have to have that pull from the government first. I mean, this is one of those technologies very similar to semiconductors. If you look back in, into the history, where if the government were to purchase you know, in volume certain capabilities, for example, uh, optical atomic clocks, that's one thing that we're building at inflection. I mean, there are data center markets for this. There are logistics markets in the commercial sector that once we can tap into that, we begin driving the cost down and making it even cheaper and, and more widely available for, for even more military customers over time, very similar to the semiconductor industry. Um, and I, I do think that that's a, a misconception that, you know, that, that, that it would be only government that would be involved, but it would be something that the government would help mature and then be the beneficiary of in the beginning, but also as the costs come down, as well as the sizes of these devices come down to hit those commercial markets as well. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, all great points. Completely agree with all of them. I think one of the things that, you know, my job within AFRL, as well as our senior scientists, Dr. Kithy and Soderberg and Quantum, is to really educate senior leaders in the Air Force on what quantum is and what it's not, right? There's a lot of hype out there. There's a lot of misconceptions that quantum, especially quantum computing, is going to solve everything, that it's the fastest supercomputer out there. You know, we, we know that's not true. So making sure, you know, to, to differentiate uh, reality from sales pitch is, is something that we uh, really put our attention on. And then the other part is, you know, how do we get technologies out there? Well, it's really creating value propositions for our warfighters and for their leaders. So developing those minimum viable products, uh, working with operators, developing the technologies, and you know, getting them out into the field as maybe first looks where we can then go and refine them. I think those are the kind of win-wins we need to really help educate uh, our leadership. Now, Laura, Heather explained that there are a lot of exciting quantum capabilities that uh, small startups like Inflection um, are innovating. Uh, could you walk us through some of the top factors that are crucial uh, to help companies transition from, you know, discoveries uh, to actual utility uh, out in the field? Well, in addition to buyers, and primarily the government as a first buyer, um, it, it's all about the supply chain in order to scale the technology and consolidating the supply chain. I mean, the, the fact is, is a lot of the supply chain for inflection, for example, is overseas. Um, it, and China already has a supply chain within its borders. This is something, you know, through military civil fusion, they can very rapidly, um, you know, uh, speed up their production. Whereas in the US, you know, we don't want to beat China to beat China. You know, we have to um, really consolidate the supply chain onshore, and we have to vertically integrate it into uh, specific companies. So that's one thing, you know, just from an inflection company standpoint, not necessarily government-related, that we're doing. We just did two acquisitions of uh, companies to help us do that. But we really just need the government uh, as a buyer uh, to, to, in, to essentially pull out and give the demand signal uh, for investors so we can begin to acquire additional companies, um, build a supply chain onshore to really push these products out of the lab and into the field. I mean, we've, we've done a number of demos. Uh, demos, you know, are, are certainly important. And now it's, okay, moving from that demo to, okay, a, a actual purchaser. Um, what about producibility? What do you need to do to scale um, production? Uh, it's setting up manufacturing capability, really building a manufacturing base um, in the United States and with like-minded allies. And, you know, that's one thing that we're looking to AUKUS to do. Uh, we have uh, offices in the UK, a subsidiary uh, in the UK and in Australia. Um, but it, it, it really is about building up the manufacturing base so we can hit scale, so we can hit the cost curves to drive down the cost of the devices as well as um, expand the number of users as the devices begin to get smaller. So for that, it, there's a lot that we're looking to the CHIPS Act for, um, but specifically for DOD, it, it really is uh, government as and DOD as a buyer. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Mike, as Heather mentioned, last spring AFRL uh, conducted a MAGNAV experiment with their mobility command, and uh, you took a 
a quantum magnometer on a C-17 and navigate around the Pacific. Um, what other kind of use cases mm -hmm. are you all looking at? Sure, I, I think um, one of the things that you know, we, we stress, especially to our junior scientists and engineers when they come in, you know, it's great to, to do work in the lab, it's great to, to write papers, develop patents, but our goal is really to, to develop technology for the Air Force, right? Invent the future for the Air Force. So there's several things we've worked on either in the past or are planning to do in the upcoming. So let me hit upon a few of those things. One, back in summer of 20. Two, uh, we did an experiment in RIMPAC uh, out in the Pacific Ocean where we took, uh, with our Five Eyes partners, quantum sensors, so things like, you know, that we've already talked about, gravimeters, gradiometers, frequency combs, uh, optical clocks, uh, IMUs, uh, put them all together in integrating architecture and aboard a shipping container, and no kidding, shipping container on a New Zealand ship for three weeks. We had our engineers out there working on uh, PNT type experiments and, and seeing what quantum could do. So, you know, pretty rough, right? We took technologies from the lab and brought them out to sea. But we learned a lot from that and it was great working with our partners as well. So we continue to build on that and that's really fueled, you know, what we need to do in the lab as well. A couple other things, uh, DIU, you mentioned them earlier, they developed a quantum sensor program. They had an initiative that just ended last year as a three-year program uh, where they're able to develop uh, with a commercial partner an atomic gyroscope. So being able to, to develop something like that, you know, with dedicated funding, I think is great moving forward. We continue to kind of push the, the envelope on other things like Rydberg sensors. Uh, the Army has a large program in that where they're looking at Rydberg and electric field sensors and what could be done there. And then finally, some of the other things we're looking at a, a little further out, quantum networking and how we can take, you know, similarly, it's great to, to develop a network on a large, stable, four by eight optical table but how can you take, say, a memory node and put it on a drone? So we're working with companies, partners such as Inflection and Colt Quanta, and how to shrink some of those technologies down, such as the vacuum cells, uh, to make them practical. And, and is this something we can even do? And it builds upon some of the other uh, drone work we did where we're distributing uh, quantum signals from a drone to a ground station. So we're going to continue to build on that and push on that moving forward. Well, very good. It sounds like uh, the underlying engineering uh, behind operationalizing quantum, if you will, is going to vary a lot uh, depending upon whatever the specific use happens to be. Um, what challenges does that pose from a technology development as well as an investment perspective? Yeah, so I, I would certainly say when we think quantum technologies, right, it's it's a marathon, it's not a race. And even when we hit 26.2 miles, it's still going to keep going, right, just as we think about our processing technologies. So it's going to con take continued and sustained investment. You know, I can't stress that enough on the R&D side and certainly as we look to field the technologies. And then developing what we're very interested in, developing things like test beds. I think that's very critical for us is to have something where we can bring in outside partners, uh, work side by side with them and bring our operators in as well, seeing what they really need as well. So having those types of test beds available are critical moving forward. Cool. Laura, you want to chime in there at all? Yeah. 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 One thing that, that we are doing um, from the company standpoint at Inflection is much of the, you know, we, we work in quantum timing, uh, timing devices, so optical time clocks, quantum sensors, RF sensors. And we also do quantum computing, and then the software layer that wraps all around it. And what's really critical for us, and, and, and sort of a differentiating factor, is that we play across all three. And when you think about having to build for each type of device, what's, what's very useful is generally, for the most part, we have the same core fundamental technology at the basis of all of it. So if you imagine a, a, a Lego block, it's the same core Lego blocks for each one. And the more that we focus on, for example, the, the integrated photonics necessary for building out optical clocks and making them really small so we can put them you know, not just on very large ships, uh, we start getting smaller in size to airplanes, you know, getting down to things like Humvees and eventually um, you know, manned devices just carrying a soldier carrying around in a backpack. Uh, being able to use that same technology and the research and the investment that goes into the clock also benefits the RF technologies that we're building out for communications um, as well as sensing, and then also benefits 
the quantum computing work that we're doing. So, you know, they're not completely differentiated for us in the terms of, you know, if, we, if we're focused on one, then the others lose out. But instead, we view it very much as a sequencing thing. Quantum computing is the hardest thing to do. That's further out. That's really sort of the, the, the high ground. If the U.S. can seize that ground eventually, that's very important. But we think that they're stepping stones along the way. And one thing that's really refreshing is, you know, DOD, it seems, looks at it that way as well. And, and we're really trying to align ourselves according to uh, DOD customers in that sequencing of, of how we're building out and commercializing the technology. Yeah, no, thanks for that. And uh, Laura, I've got a, another question for you. Um, what are the, is some of the common misperceptions that you hear about the state of quantum technologies from perspective of customers, and what do you think drive in their thinking? Well, I, I think that there's a lot of one focus on quantum computing because that just sucks all the air out of the room with all the headlines. <laughs> yeah. It's really hard to distinguish um, it, it, what's real versus what's not. I mean, feel like every day you get some sort of announcement from a lab uh, or a university about a breakthrough. And you know that that's more media hype than anything. Though you know there's a lot of great work that's going on. That's one. And and the second piece would be that that there is a lot of hype in general, not just quantum computing, but, but just on quantum. And you know I think to some degree, actually a large degree, that's a self-inflicted wound from companies. Um, and you know companies, we have to do better. We have to be really clear about what we're building what we think the timelines are, what we see and know are the challenges to getting it out of the lab and into the field. And, um, you know, not sort of pushing those hype messages that, that a lot of people see. And, you know, really it's about building trust. Is this a company that you want to work with or not? Um, do we do what we say we're going to do or not? Uh, so that, that's, that's very important. Another, and I think the last uh, piece that I think is often um, you know, a misperception is just that the venture capital or private investors are plenty out there and that they're just willing to fund this technology um, to see it to its natural end. And that's, you know, maybe that was the case uh, before 2021, uh, before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, before the macroeconomic environment changed with inflation, but it's definitely changed now and that's why government uh, and industrial policy is so critical. Okay, well, thanks for that. Um, I do want to leave some time for Q&A for the audience, uh, but there's one question that I, I'll finish up here before we, we shift over and ask you to just give me as, as tight a, a response as you can. That the holy grail of uh, defense innovation uh, is achieving a revolution in military affairs. You all have heard that terminology before. Uh, and I, what my question is, is how might advances in quantum technology work with other technologies that we hear about, AI, hypersonics, machine learning, directed energy, to achieve or enable a 21st century RMA? Mike, why don't you? Sure, I, I think a natural one, the easy one to speak to would be artificial intelligence. I see a play for artificial intelligence. And again, you only know, have to counter the hype there, artificial intelligence is gonna solve everything. But I think there's a tight interplay there. So we saw with the AFRL magnav experiment, the role that artificial intelligence had there in nulling the magnetic field of the plane, be able to take that out of the measurement. But other things where AI can play, certainly in the design space, of quantum sensors, quantum clocks. Uh, it, it's going to have a huge role there, and certainly as we look to scale things up, I think AI is going to have a strong play. Uh, more so as well, I think AI will play in uh, you know things like um, how quantum computers can assist AI, um, quantum assisted uh, AI and machine learning. I think it'll be something that's a key area of quantum computers when it gets there as well. So I think you know AI's I think we're just scratching the surface, but merging those fields, that's something we think about a lot in AFRL. It's not going to be a panacea, but it's certainly going to uh, continue to develop over the years. Good. Laura, we'll give you the second shot at this one. Yeah, I mean, we, we certainly are monitoring and tracking AI quite closely. We acquired a company about a year and a half ago that's a software company that was also focused on you know, how quantum and AI will merge in the future. Uh, you know, again, this is an area where there's a lot of hype and we have to be really uh, careful and intentional in, in, in how we represent what we say. Um, but ultimately, technologies begin to converge. I mean, that's the, the course. If history has taught us anything over the last uh, 50 to 100 years, it's that. So is this something that we're focused on? Absolutely. 
I think quantum-enabled warfare could begin to fill some of those gaps that traditional advantages and technologies that we've relied upon for the past 30 years are becoming less and less dominant. So as we look at some of the capabilities, and, and uh, Laura is absolutely right, it's a stepping stone. So as we field timing and sensing and uh, Rydberg sensors and so forth, that will accelerate the broader field of quantum. And then as you begin to integrate that, you get a synergistic effect. Yep. And so, you know, to avoid the hype but keep the promise, um, I think we don't know what we don't know. So we need to start small and start with the engineering problems of getting the technologies that are near term, integrating them onto platforms, and seeing where it goes. And warfighters are going to be key to this. So marrying warfighters and the technologists yeah. tightly together is absolutely essential to being able to see the full potential of not just quantum, but all these other technologies that we're pursuing. Uh, no, I think that's excellent. Uh, perhaps Air Force should put together a command that might <laughs> ma marry the operators with the technologists. What do we you have think to have enough that? operators, though. We have okay. to have enough operators. <laughs> OK, I'm, I, I, that's a bit of a preview of what you might <laughs> see coming with the Secretary's new optimization for great power conflict. So let's shift now to um, our audience. You all out there know the drill. If you have a question, use the raise hand function, uh, state your name and affiliation. <clears throat> Uh, and we'll jump right in. I've got a couple of uh, great questions here on the chat, um, starting uh, with Mr. Doug Berkey. If you were to advise Congress, what metrics would you suggest that they use as they oversee DOD activities in quantum to assess progress and risk? I'll just throw that out for any of you. It's a good question because, you know, con Congress is going to have an oversight function, so what can what, what what should they use to measure progress here? So I would start out with crawl, walk, run. We need to move past just the the lab in the box and the you know as as Dr. Hadick said, you know the stable you know table that we have these capabilities on, and is is DoD are the services actually moving the technology? forward into operational experiments to, to validate the use cases, understand the engineering and integration problems so they can move towards fielding. So um, that's really what I would focus on if I was DOD is how are you making the technology real? Yeah, I think that's a fair point. That was something I was going to mention earlier and I actually forgot was, um, you know, there's, uh, as we look for the 2024 budget, in which you know, I'm sure we'll be getting soon, uh, there's appropriations in there for quantum. And we'll see how all that gets appropriated. But I think that's a great first step in really focusing some funding on, say, 6.3 type applications, advanced technology demonstrations. And you know, I think those will provide some great metrics. Are we at the right maturity level to be able to move quantum from the lab out into the field, uh, hitting you know, uh, something of significance to the DOD? Okay, here's one from uh, Pete Ford. Uh, what does this panel of experts think our adversaries will do first with their quantum computers? What's their threat vector and first attack? Laura, you want to take this? You already began to mention it. I, I mean, I, I, look, they're already uh, sucking up all the information they can, holding it for the one day that they have a quantum computer and can begin to uh, break some of the encryption with it. Um, I, I think the first thing is we won't know. We won't know when the first shots are fired in the war, uh, when China actually has the capability. So I think they'll start to very selectively uh, decrypt some of our most sensitive government messages and that they've held, and, and we just won't know. Um, yeah, it'll take a lot for them to do that. Though. I mean, to, to, to and I, I'm sure that Mike could, could add to this. I mean, this, this is not a trivial matter. Um, so yeah, I do think that that's somewhat in the future, but certainly something that we should be focused on now from a government perspective of hardening uh, our encryption to make sure that you know every message that's sent across is, is not susceptible to that sort of decryption in the future. I think another issue that I, that I worry about is that if China um, is able to operationalize um, alternate sensing modal methodologies or phenomenologies. So moving outside of like just radar um, and they're able to field um, electromagnetic sensors or gravimeters or gradiometers and operationalize them, they essentially move outside our ability to counter that. And so that would enable them to have a real dominance 
in operational execution and war fighting that we would not be able to understand, counter, or move against. So it would provide them sort of an, and well, not sort of, it would provide them a real asymmetric advantage, and that's, that's what concerns me. Mm -hmm. I think just uh, the only thing I would add, and Laura, uh, Laura had alluded to, would be uh, post-quantum cryptography and how we counter the threat now. If you go back to National Security Memorandum 10, put out not too long ago, you know, really in securing our networks and looking at new techniques to counter quantum computers once they are out there. It's going to take a while to get there, but as Laura, you know, so well said, we, we need to do it now. Yeah, and we're focused on DOD, but we need to remember that quantum computing and the ability to decrypt has broader implications uh, towards our, our all of it, everything that we do within yeah. the United States and across the globe. So specifically the financial markets, uh, medical, so there's a lot of areas that quantum touches, um, especially quantum computing and decryption, that we haven't spoken to here today. Well, which the, leads right into another question. Uh, nice segue, where do we stand on the post-quantum key encryption methods? Right, so I'll, I'll just briefly hit upon that. Uh, not an area of my uh, specialty, but um, as I alluded to, National Security Memorandum 10 laid out you know, certain timelines that the U.S. government needs to, to follow. Uh, and there, I think part of the, the, the crux of it is uh, new algorithms that are being developed. Uh, this is NIST working in partnership uh, with uh, you know, collaborators out there from industry and academia and developing uh, these new algorithms. Now they're going through testing, there were four selected initially. Uh, those are continuing to be worked on, they're looking at some new ideas. And ultimately for us in the Air Force, you know, we'll, we'll implement once uh, NSA uh, certifies them and we'll be able to secure our networks you know, at a different level of security there. But uh, there is a lot of work going on into that area and rightly so. Thanks for that. Here's one from uh, Sydney Freeberg of uh, Breaking Defense. Um, on the winding road to quantum, what are the dead ends? The applications that look cool but probably won't work, uh, sort of like the quantum radar um, Heather mentioned. Well, you stole my example. Yeah, that's, 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 a great, that's a great example, yeah. though, right? <laughs> well, Sydney was listening, so he was paying attention. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, and that's part of the reason why it's really important for policymakers and warfighters to understand the science because what works in theory, so theoretically, quantum radar is really exciting. You can go see something that's stealthy. So it, it works at a theoretical and conceptual level. You might be able to validate, uh, you know, the behavior of the photons. Um, you know, seven photons in a box, seven, pair, uh, seven pairs in a, in, a, in a container. But then when you actually operationalize it, you realize this is not pragmatic at all. So while I, other than quantum radar, I don't have specific examples to provide you, but this is why, again, uh, foot stomp that, that senior leaders and warfighters need to understand the, the technology and work with the technologists, work with the engineers, and they say, you know what, that doesn't make sense when I actually put it into a demanding operational scenario. But you know this other thing? That's pretty cool. Let's go pursue that instead. And so there's creativity, operational creativity, that can occur from both sides, from, from the push from the technologists and the pull from the warfighters. And when we put them together, that's when we are able to validate use cases. Yeah, yeah I, would, I would add you know, an inflection. We've been around for 16 years. So we've certainly gone down certain paths. And it's not necessarily about the dead end, but more of everything is about markets and time. I mean, um, you know, the first iPhone was not actually, you know, the iPhone itself. There were other companies creating it, but the market just wasn't ready. People just weren't ready for it. So for us, it goes all to, back to the sequencing aspect and timing being the first thing that we have to make sure that we secure our timing networks uh, when we think about China from a defense perspective and then understanding that there are major commercial markets that also go along with that as the first step as we evolve eventually to quantum computing and quantum networks fully entangled with quantum internet. Laura, I'm glad you mentioned timing because I think people think about timing on their on their watches and they don't really understand that timing is so much more than knowing where you on, uh, are on Earth. Timing impacts everything from our financial markets to our uh, operational uh, warfighting data links to how we fuse information within the cockpit. So timing is utterly critical and if we are not able to secure our timing and begin to improve our timing, that's a real vulnerability for us in the battle space. Okay, um, we've got time for one more, and this is an interesting one from uh, our good friend Brian Mora. Regarding Heather's comment about sensing technology, 
How vulnerable might U.S. and allied submarine forces be to Chinese sensors leveraging quantum? Crickets. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, right. yeah, obviously that's a sensitive it's area, but right. you know, sensors that can uh, penetrate um, uh, the opacity of the uh, of the oceans uh, certainly uh, have potential for game changing. Uh, to truly use that word, effects, um, as does directed energy, but that's a whole other subject area that. Um, perhaps we'll dig into next time. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, as I mentioned, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of our uh, Mitchell Institute uh, paper uh, rollout. And uh, thanks, Heather, for an awesome job. Yes. Um, all three parts of Heather's uh, paper are available at uh, mitchellaerospacepower.org. Uh, and so I'd like to thank you again for a great report. Uh, and to Mike and Laura, thank you very much for taking the time to be here today. And for everyone else out there in the audience, uh, I'd like to wish you all a, a great air and space power kind of day. <laughs>